الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to another installment of Analyzing the Address where we revisit the day's khutbah talk about it in a little bit additional detail offer additional information and context and content that we're unable to mention given the time constraints of the khutbah and even offer you an opportunity to offer any feedback and ask any questions about the khutbah that you may you may have and today uh, the title of the khutbah was Allah's counsel to Muslim communities part one and I'd like to revisit a few passages from the khutbah and expand upon those in the time that we have uh, before us this evening. So we opened up the khutbah by mentioning how Allah and His Messenger in the Quran and the Hadith have been highly attentive to the subject of Muslim unity and fostering a cohesive Muslim community. And we said that's why we find that they have prohibited in the Quran and Hadith every behavior that can lead to enmity and division. And we're going to look at some of those. We looked at some of the behaviors um, that are prohibited today in the khutbah. And we'll look at some more of those that are prohibited in Hujurat in coming uh, Fridays. But I'd like to give a few examples from the Sunnah. Just to show you how keen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger have been to foster community spirit and to foster Muslim unity by prohibiting everything that can undermine and threaten that community spirit and that Muslim unity. So for example, we have the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi sallam he said, إِذَا كُنْتُمْ ثَلَاثًا فَلَا يَتَنَاجَ إِثْنَانِ دُونَ صَاحِبِهِمَا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ يُحْزِنُ he said, if you are all three, or if three of you are all together, do not let two of you go off and whisper, excluding their companion from their conversation, because that certainly will upset him. It will vex him. It will make him think that the conversation that you are having is about him, that you're speaking about him. This will create enmity. It will sow the seeds of division and discord amongst you. Another example. The Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, لا يخطب أحدكم على خطبة أخي. He said, let not one of you propose to a woman to whom your brother has already proposed. Why? Because this will create enmity and hatred and sow the seeds of division and discord. And rather than being united, the two of you will be divided and at odds with each other. We also have the Hadith, one more example, where the Prophet وسلم, he said, وَلَا تَنَافَسُوا وَلَا تَحَاسَدُوا وَلَا تَبَغَضُوا وَكُونُوا عِبَادُ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا He said, do not vie against one another in the pursuit of worldly possessions. Do not envy one another. Do not despise one another. Rather be, O servants of Allah, brothers to one another. So here you see the Prophet ﷺ, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Why? Because it will undermine Islam, it will undermine Muslim brotherhood. It will underline Muslim. It will, it will undermine Muslim unity. You see the Prophet, and you'll find a lot of a hadith like this, where the Prophet is saying, "Don't do this. Don't do this. Why? Because these behaviors undermine Muslim unity, and they prevent the achievement of a cohesive Muslim community." And then we went on the khutbah. We mentioned that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has dedicated the greater part of an entire surah, Surah Al-Hujurat. To this end, to the end of counting the Muslims on their interpersonal relations, those interpersonal relations which will foster a cohesive Muslim community. And I just wanted to focus uh, briefly on this Surah Al-Hujurat. Surah Al-Hujurat, you can call it a social bill of rights. You can call it bylaws, bylaws for Islamic communities. But it is essentially a set of guidelines which establishes standards for interpersonal relations in the Muslim society. The type 
the Muslim society that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the Muslims to reside in, wants them to create. Allah expects us, these bylaws, these guidelines, are guidelines and bylaws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects us to live by. And if we live by them, it will provide happiness for us as individuals and us as a collective community, a community as a whole. And so this surah is a very important surah for individual Muslims and Muslim communities to study and strive to embody. When Muslims get together to form community and they establish their constitutions and bylaws for their masajid, how many of them consult Surah Al-Hujurat? How many of them incorporate the teachings of this surah which really is the, it's the foundation for the akhlaq for the characters of the Muslim society or the characters that have something to do with interpersonal relations, how Muslims deal with each other and how they can live together in a way where the individual and the community can be healthy and not toxic, can be functional and not dysfunctional. And so it's very important for us as individuals to study this so we know how to get along with each other, with other Muslims and also for communities as a whole, so they can create and foster this Muslim community, this utopian, uh, near utopian society that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to live in and has laid out the guidelines for it to be established in Surat Al-Hujurat. Then we went on in the khutbah and we focused, uh, we began to talk about the individual ayahs or the individual phrases from the ayah that was the focus of the khutbah. The ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ijitanibu kathira min al-dhan, inna ba'd al-dhanni itham. O you who believe, avoid a great deal of suspicion. Indeed, some suspicion is sin. And we came to the part in the khutbah where we focused on the statement of Allah, ijitanibu kathira min al-dhan. Avoid a great deal of suspicion. And we said, qala kathira min al-dhan wa lam yaqul kull al-dhan. Allah said, avoid a great deal of suspicion and he didn't say avoid all suspicion because some suspicion is justified and therefore not prohibited and not something that we are supposed to avoid. And this is evidence we mentioned the khutbah by the statement that has been attributed to Al-Farooq, Umar Al-Khattab in which he said, مَنْ عَرَضَ نَفْسَهُ لِلتُّحْمَةِ فَلَا يَلُمَّنَّ مَنْ أَسَاءَ الظَّنَّ بِهِ Whoever exposes himself to suspicion should not blame those who are suspicious of him. And here I'd like to add another statement of Umar, which was relayed by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, in which Umar radiallahu anhu, he was report, he was, he was, uh, Ibn Mas'ud reported that Umar said, Inna, inna nasan kanu yu'khaduna bil wahi fi ahdi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَإِنَّ الْوَحْيَ قَدْ انْقَطَعَ وَإِنَّمَا نَأْخُذُكُمْ وَإِنَّمَا نَأْخُذُكُمْ وَإِنَّمَا نَأْخُذُكُمْ الْآنَ بِمَا ظَهَرَ لَنَا مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ فَمَنْ أَظْهَرَ لَنَا فَمَنْ أَظْهَرَ لَنَا خَيْرًا أَمَنَّاهُ وَقَرَّبْنَاهُ وَلَيْسَ لَنَا مِنْ سَرِيرَتِهِ شَيْءٌ اللَّهُ يُحَاسِبُهُ فِي سَرِيرَتِهِ وَمَنْ أَظْهَرَ لَنَا سُوءًا لَمْ نَأْمَنْهُ وَلَمْ نُصَدِّقْهُ وَإِنْ قَالَ إِنَّ سَرِيرَتَهُ وَإِنْ قَالَ إِنَّ سَرِيرَتَهُ حَسَنًا So this is a very important effort that complements what we mentioned the khutbah and which I like to expand upon briefly and in it Omar he says he says in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam some people were called to account. They were exposed through revelation. Now revelation has ceased. And therefore we shall judge you by your apparent acts. Whoever displays goodness to us, we shall grant him peace and security. And draw him near to us. His hidden secrets are none of our concern. Allah will call him to account for what he might conceal, which contradicts what he reveals. But whosoever shows evil to us, and this is the shahid, this is the point that I really want us to focus on. But whosoever shows evil to us, 
we shall not grant him security, nor shall we believe him. Underscore this phrase, nor shall we believe him. The one who shows us evil, shows us that which contradicts the deen of Allah and is considered immoral and criminal in the deen of Allah. We shall not believe him, even if he profess that his intention is good. Even if he says, yeah, I steal from the rich, but I give to the poor and my intention is good. Stealing is haram. We can't condone stealing even if it's done with a good intention. This is the meaning of what Omar is saying. And there is some fawa there are some fawa there's some benefits and, and certain messages that are being relayed in this statement from Omar ibn al-Khattab. He said, number one, or number one from the fawa and the messages and the rasail that are being sent to us by the statement of Umar al-Khattab is that he who displays good works should be deemed good, regardless of what is in his heart. So we have, for example, we have some good imams inviting to goodness. They're upright and outwardly committed. As far as we can tell, they are good people and they do good things. But unfortunately, those imams who are good people and they do good things, we don't see them doing anything wrong. We see them doing a lot of things right. A lot of times, those imams are mistrusted. Those imams are the victims of intense scrutiny and skepticism. Good imams, it is said about them, yeah, he did that good thing, but I think he's up to something. I think, I think he has a hidden agenda. I think he's doing this to put himself in a certain position or to attain a certain worldly benefit. This is what people say about good imams who are showing us nothing but good. And this is wrong. Which, as, as we see from the statement of Omar, which he said, if a person shows us good, we will deem him as good. And we will bring him close to us. And we have nothing to do his secret is none of our concern. What he's harboring in his heart is none of our concern. We just take him at his word. What is, what is he showing us? Then that's what he is as far as we're concerned and we leave his secrets, his hidden secrets to Allah. On the other hand, number two from the Fawaid is he who displays evil deeds. He who does that which contradicts the deen, violates the teachings of the deen, says the opposite of what Allah says does the opposite of what, Allah, of what Allah says a believer should do. It should be deemed, that person should be deemed evil. Regardless of what he may or may not be, I'm sorry, regardless of what may or may not be in his heart. So we have, brothers and sisters, just like on one side of the coin, we have these goody mams calling to good, outwardly committed. As far as we can see, they're upright and good and righteous people. On the other side of the coin, we have imams who invite to evil. We have imams, Azakumullah, I hate to say this, but I need to say it because sometimes we have to be explicit. We have imams who are openly gay. Openly gay imams. Imams who, if they're not gay, they still promote homosexuality. They seem to approve of it. And in, in, what's indicative of their approval is some of them will actually, actually conduct gay marriages. Imams who conduct gay marriages and condone gay marriages. Their character is immoral. Their actions are questionable at best. And they are outwardly corrupt. And I don't want to, I, I just gave that one example, but there are many examples that we can give of some of the things that these so-called celebrity imams are doing and are up to and are accused of and are fighting legal battles about that we won't mention here, but it just shows us something about them. Right? And Omar is saying about those people, that if they're showing us evil, we have, to, we, have to, we have to look at them in light of what they're showing us. And what we can't do is say, oh, we don't know what their intention is. Their intention is not our issue. It's not our, it's not our, it's not our, our, our business to concern ourselves with their intention. As Omar said, we have nothing to do. Their hidden secrets, their intentions are none of our concern. Which brings us to the third point. We're not expected to judge except by what is apparent. Only Allah knows a person's intention. And we are not expected to judge people based upon what their intention could possibly be, what their intention might be. Only Allah knows the intention 
So if you have, for example, an imam who attends a pride parade and carries a banner that says that um, love, uh, love is love. Love knows no boundaries, right? Love doesn't have, uh, uh, I don't know, a gender specification, whatever the banner says, and he carries it during a pride parade, and you all know what a pride parade is, regardless of his intention, the Omar, he said, لَمْ نُصَدِّقْهُ وَإِنْ قَالَ سَرِيرَتَهُ وَإِنْ قَالَ إِنَّ سَرِيرَتَهُ حَسَنًا he said, we will not believe him if he shows us evil. We will not believe him if he says, even if he says his intention is good. And last but not least, I want to mention in relation to this, that Al-Qurtubi rahimahullah ta'ala, he's relayed that the majority of the scholars hold that having a negative opinion or evil assumptions about someone who is outwardly good and is displaying goodness, he said, this is la yajuz. He said, most of the scholars say it's not permissible when someone is showing you good for you to have a negative intention. Well, he's up to something. I bet if we watch him long enough, we'll see. He's up to something. He's up to something. The person is doing nothing but good, but we assume the worst about the person doing good, which, which to me, is, it, it boggles my mind. People who show you nothing but goodness, and we assume the worst about them, and people who show us evil, we're making... A, we're making we're making a multitude of excuses for those people. Why they might be committing sins openly. We're making excuses and a person shows us good and we mistrust him. That's the opposite of what we're supposed to do. And we're going to talk about what, what, what apparently might be an apparent contradiction. We're going to talk about that later in something that we mentioned toward the end of the khutbah. But we'll get to that. Then al Qurtubi goes on and says, and he said there's no harm whatsoever, according to the majority of the scholars, in having an evil assumption about someone who shows you wickedness. Someone shows you wickedness. Some, someone, uh, you, you actually have, have, have seen them publicly intoxicated. You've seen them coming in and out of bars. And then one day they come and they have this smell on their breath that really, you can't be a positive, but it sure smells like alcohol. There's no harm if you assume it's alcohol because what? They've shown you wickedness. طيب. Then we went on and we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, إِنَّ بَعْضَ الظَّنِّ إِثَمْ Indeed, some suspicion is sin. Not all suspicion, but some suspicion is sin. And we said, so what is this suspicion which is sin? And basically we said it includes two things. One, ظَنُّكَ السُّوبِ أَخِيكَ الْمُسْلِمِ بِلَا مُسْتَنَدْ Jumping to conclusions about a fellow Muslim without good cause. And the second one we said, was suspicion that causes a person to speak openly about what he suspects or to actively seek to verify his suspicion by spying, etc. This, these two are the two types of suspicion which are evil, which means anything outside of that is not evil, so, or not sinful. So, the first type of suspicion that's sinful is when you don't have a good reason to suspect someone. That really, your suspicion is unfounded, groundless, or baseless. Right? And then the second one is when your suspicion, it, 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 it causes you to act. You act on your suspicion. Hmm. You know, what is that person doing here at this time? What is he doing in the masjid at this time of day? Let me watch him. Let me watch him and see what he's going to do. Who is he talking to on the phone? Let me go and try to overhear what he's saying. That suspicion that caused you to do that is the suspicion which is sinful. Or the second type of suspicion which is sinful. Then we mentioned... Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on and continues to give a practical example of this acting on suspicion. He says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا And do not spy upon one another. Which means, do not actively pursue the faults of other Muslims who have given you no reason to do so, but rather, تَغَافُلُوا Allah is saying, basically he's saying, تَغَافَلُوا He's saying, look the other way. Act as if you have not seen anything. Mind your own business and do not concern yourself with that which does not concern you. And continue to give other Muslims the benefit of the doubt until you are absolutely forced, absolutely forced to be skeptical. For example, let's say that um, let's say, for example, that an imam was teaching a class in the masjid for children. So he comes to the class, he sits, and he's teaching them, right? 
And a person could begin to assume things about that imam. But he has no basis for that. What he sees gives him no reason to think that the imam is doing anything wrong, other than doing his job. So in a case like that, you what? You taghafalu. You just what? You mind your own business. You're not sitting there looking and watching and inspecting and probing and surveilling to wait and see, is he going to do something? He's going to make a mistake. Right? You don't do that. If you have an imam who preaches and teaches and makes, uh, makes videos and he makes uh, um, lectures, etc., you don't go to the lecture sitting there looking and waiting and listening to see, hmm, is he going to make a mistake? Is he going to say anything wrong? Looking for something. No, you don't do that. Taqafalu. Mind your own business. Don't concern yourself with that. It's not concern you. Don't look for what? Don't look for faults. Don't actively look for faults. So the message here is twofold. And this is important. That the basic rule when it comes to other Muslims and the actions of other Muslims and what they're doing in their daily lives, we're supposed to what? We're supposed to netagafal. We're supposed to what? To mind their own business, overlook, and not be overly concerned, overly attentive to what they are doing and what, they, what, what possibly they might be doing that is not apparent to the eye, right? That requires an additional what? Additional level of surveillance. We don't do that. As the Prophet said in the hadith, مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءُ تَرْكُهُ لِمَا لَا يَعْنِي from the, good, from the excellence of a person's Islam is that he minds his own business. He doesn't concern himself with that which is not concerning. But... What if the Muslim openly commits a crime? You're not looking for it. You're not looking to see if he does something wrong, but you happen upon it. You're not looking for it, but the person just happens in your presence to do something, presence to do something which is wrong. Or the fact that someone did something wrong comes to your attention. You are informed that so-and-so did X, by someone who is trustworthy and credible. In a case like that, brothers and sisters, we have no choice but to respond appropriately. It is not appropriate for us and netagafal. It's not appropriate for us at that point to what? To turn a blind eye and act like we haven't heard or seen anything. The Prophet said in the hadith of Bisa'i, he about Muslim, Man ra'a minkum munkaran, Whoever amongst you sees an evil deed, a crime being committed, he said what? Then change it with your hand. He commanded us. You have to do something about it. You see something? Do something. Only if you're unable to do something about it, to physically put a stop to it. You can't do something, but you see something? Then say something. Say, this is wrong. I disapprove of this. This goes against what our religion teaches. You need to stop this. You can't physically stop them. You tell them to stop. And we can't, we have to understand, brothers and sisters, because a lot of people, when Muslims openly commit crimes, they tell us, Taghafal, Taghafal, mind your own business. Why are you worried about him and what he's doing? That's none of your business. It doesn't, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't concern you. No. This person is sinning openly, committing a crime openly. And it may affect me directly, or affect my family, or affect my community, or affect the Muslims at large. Or at the very least, it's a wrong, and the Prophet said if there's a wrong being done and you see it, you can't just sit idly by and let it take place. You have to do one of three things. You have to either stop it if you can stop it, or, or speak about it if you can speak about it. And if you can't do either of those two, you have to at the very least hate it in your heart. And use your relationship, distance yourself from the person who's committing the crime. And we have to, brothers and sisters, we have to stop doing this. We have to stop... Basically practicing one text and ignoring another. We have to stop being the people who will practice this one that says taghafa. And we won't practice the one that says, don't, in these circumstances, lat taghafa. In these circumstances, you can't look the other way. You can't throw a blind eye. You have to what? You have to act. We also have to understand, brothers and sisters, that we can't interpret one text in a way that renders another text meaningless. We can't interpret this ayah, la wala tajassasu in a way that negates the hadith where the Prophet said, مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ Whoever amongst you sees an evil, then let him change it with his hand. فَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِ Whoever cannot do that, then with his tongue. And I want to give a practical example عَلَىٰ أُجَالَةٍ سَرِيعَةٍ Just so you can see how a lot of people do this. 
how a lot of people just totally misunderstand how we're supposed to operate as Muslims and how we're supposed to make harmony between the texts in a way where we're acting by both of them and not practicing one, ignoring another, or interpreting one in a way that renders another one meaningless. Example, there was, there's a community uh, in the States, one of those bigger, large communities with a massive uh, masjid, huge prayer hall, Islamic school, uh, multi-purpose room, gym, and you know, just a huge campus, uh, all the amenities, one of those very affluent, large communities. And it happened in that community that they had a uh, Quran teacher for youth who was uh, imported. He was brought from overseas to teach uh, young children the Quran. And basically there were some uh, credible accusations that he had inappropriately touched some children. Inappropriately some, touched some children that he was teaching. And the response of the administration that masjid was what? Netagafa. We're just going to what? Turn a blind eye and act like this didn't happen. And we're going to help that person es escape any type of repercussions or consequences for his actions by getting him a plane ticket and getting him out of here and back to his home country before what? Before he is brought to justice for what he allegedly had done. So here, brothers and sisters, this approach was wrong. They're thinking, well, well that's a just system. You know, we don't, you know, we don't probe. We don't surveil. You know, this is what people were saying, but we don't know for sure. We didn't see it with our own eyes. And so, netagafa. We just turn a blind eye. We just overlook. We look the other way. But this tagafal, brothers and sisters, it does not apply to clear transgressions or instances where the rights of others are, are usurped, have been violated, or their safety is threatened. And imagine if you were the parent of that child who was inappropriate or inappropriately touched. Would you appreciate the fact that your child was violated and no justice was served? Would you appreciate that? And you have to live with the trauma, whatever trauma that may come immediately and in the future of that child because of what this person did that other people said, yeah, that's not what the ayah means. That's not what the ayah means. That's not what Allah is telling us to do. We have to understand in light of the statement of the Prophet, if you see it, if you witness it, or you come to know of it, it is brought to your attention, then what? Then you have to act. You have to do something and respond appropriately. And lastly, brothers and sisters, we close the khutbah by mentioning some of the hadith where the Prophet echoed what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about su avan, about evil assumptions and uh, prohibited suspicion. And we mentioned the hadith collected by Ahmed and Abu Dawood on the authority of Abi Barza, uh, radiallahu anhu, authenticated by Imam al authenticated by Imam al Bani rahimahullah ta'ala, in which the Prophet said, Ya ma'ashara man amana bi lisani, wa lam yadkhul al imanu qalbahu. لا تغتابوا المسلمين ولا تتبعوا أوراتهم فمن تتبع فمن تتبع أو فمن تتبع عورة أخيه المسلم تتبع الله أورته ومن تتبع الله أورته يفضحه ولو في جوف بيتي. The hadith where the prophet said, he said, O oh, audience of those who have believed with their tongues, but true faith has yet to enter their hearts. Do not backbite the Muslims. And do not search after their shortcomings. For verily, he who searches after the faults of his brother Muslim, Allah will unearth his faults. And he who Allah unearths his faults, Allah will expose him even in the, indiscre in, even the indiscretions he commits in the privacy of his own home. Now, I just want to close with a note and reiterate something that we said earlier because this hadith will create a shubha in light of what we said previously. And that is that, okay, so, you know, we're not supposed to, like, look for other people's faults. And so that means what? If people are doing things, even if we see it, we just what? We mind our own business. No, that's not what the hadith means. Because this does not apply as a, as a pair from the wording and also a pair from the hadith of Isa'id al-Khudri. That this does not apply to those who sin, violate the teachings of Islam, and commit illegal acts openly, al-mujahideen. This hadith is not applicable to al-mujahideen. Look at the word in the Prophet. وَمَن تَتَبَّعَ عَوْرَةَ أَخِيهِ الْمُسْلِمِ 
Al Aura, what is Al Aura? It's something that you cover and conceal. The person is looking for what the person has concealed. What the person has kept between him and Allah, the person is looking for that. Yeah, that's illegal, that's prohibited. But the person who sins openly, we're not looking for his faults, he's what? He's putting his faults on display. And so when people say, why you, you know, when you point out, hey man, this guy went to a pride parade. Hey man, this guy is openly gay. Hey man, this guy is marrying, you know, same doing, performing same-sex marriages. You point this out, which the person is doing open. The person says, why are you searching for his faults? The Prophet said, Don't follow the, don't search for the mistakes and faults of the Muslim. I'm not, we're not searching for anything. The person is doing it openly. And they'll quote this hadith as approved, but the, the hadith is not applicable to this issue in the least. We're not searching for this. The person is doing it openly. And this is important, brothers and sisters, because right now we have these celebrity imams who are doing many things and saying many things that go against the teachings of Islam. Some of them go against the moral teachings of Islam. And some of them go against the theological teachings of Islam. They're actually telling us that the beliefs that generations of Muslims have accepted and acknowledged as true and being part of the Islamic aqidah, the Islamic theology, those beliefs are wrong. And we should abandon those beliefs and begin to accept and incorporate new beliefs that they themselves have unearthed and discovered are really what the people should have been believing. And those people from the past, they didn't believe correctly because they didn't have the advantages that we have and exposure that we have to other forms of knowledge outside of the Islamic uh, sources. So we should abandon what they believed or adapt our beliefs and reform our beliefs in accordance with what? With this new knowledge from other non-Islamic sources. And so you have some imams, some scholars, some sheikhs, some preachers and du'at and just concerned Muslims who are speaking out and saying this person is saying this and what they're saying is wrong. And they shouldn't be followed and listened to because of the bad things and evil things that they are propagating and promoting. And those imams who are doing this are being attacked. Those imams are being accused of being bad, being jealous, being whatever. But in reality, why are those imams pushing back? They're pushing back because if they allow these imams to preach the things that they're preaching, which contradict the moral and theological teachings of our religion, then those imams can mislead and confuse others. If they're silent, if these other imams, these good imams, remain silent, these bad imams, these wicked imams, will confuse people. They will mislead people because the people will, will hear them say things and they'll say to themselves, hey, Ahmed, I thought, that, I thought we couldn't do that. I thought we weren't supposed to believe in that. They'll say that to themselves, but when they don't see any people of knowledge which is on par with the knowledge of the people who are speaking and spreading these falsehoods, they'll think it must be true because these other people are quiet. They're tacitly approving of what these other imams are saying. So these imams, these good imams, they feel forced. They feel compelled to say something. And a lot of times they try to be polite about it. They try not to mention names. They just talk in general about the things that these people are doing and hope that people, the light will go on. Bing, oh, I shouldn't be listening to this person because he's doing that. He's saying those things. So even when they try to be polite, they get pushed back. And this is important, brothers and sisters. We have to understand how important this is. We are at a crossroads. We are definitely at a crossroads. And we need to understand that, and it's, I just want to close with this point and say this. I kept saying good imams versus bad imams, and some people will take issue with that. They say, how are you going to say good imams and bad imams? These people are imams. These imams, they're imams. They're working for Allah. They're doing good for Allah, etc., etc. I'm going to say two things. First of all, this is the uh, good imams and bad imams. It's not my word. These are the words of the Prophet. He said, The thing that I fear the most for you 
are those misguiding scholars, those scholars who teach with evil intent, with malicious intent. They want to misguide you. They seek to misguide you. They appear in the cloak of scholarship and knowledge and piety and reality inside themselves is a very, um, a very um, salacious, a very wicked and wicked hidden agenda. The prophet is saying this, not me. The second thing is you have to understand that the shaitan can come to us in many suwar. And one of those surah is the, one of those suwar is the suwar of a goody man. The suwar of someone who's pious, calling to Allah, and so sincere, and so meek, and so humble. The shaitan can come in many suwar. suwar. But the one thing the shaitan can't do is he can't, and, he, and the shaitan will call to good. He will call to good. As some of the early scholars said, they said if the shaitan wants to cause you to enter into one door of evil, he will open for you a hundred doors to good to lead you to evil. The shaitan can call to good. But the one thing the shaitan will not do is not continuously call to good. At some point, He'll call to good and call to good until what? Until he gains your trust. And then he will call to evil. He will openly call to evil. Why? Because that's his end game. His end game is not to guide you to Jannah. His end game is to guide you to hellfire. And you have to understand, brothers and sisters, sometimes we have to wake up and, and see that if somebody openly contradicts what Allah says, Allah is saying left and the person saying right, that person, no matter how good they may appear, they can't be good. Just like, just like Omar said, if you show us evil, lam nusaddiq. The person who shows us evil, lam nusaddiqhu. Wa in qala, wa in, wa in qala, inna sariratahu hasana. That the person who shows us evil, we won't, we won't say he's good. We won't believe him. We won't believe him if he shows us evil. If he, if he says, if he says, oh, left, and, and, the, and the Quran says right, we're not going to believe him. We're not going to follow him even if he says, I have good intentions for saying, for saying left. And with that, we bring our commentary on today's khutbah to a close. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance because we are in desperate need of his guidance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessings because we are in desperate need of his blessings. We ask Allah to bless you, to bless you and make you blessed wherever you may be, to bless your houses, your spouses, your children, your wealth, your life, your health. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge and who he blesses to truly benefit from that knowledge by making us from those who put it into practice. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.